Good morning. morning. It's always truly a thrill to be here at Zionsville Fellowship. As Drew mentioned, I've been here several times before. Always friendly faces, familiar faces, uh, and always eager to meet more of you. Uh, And so thank you from the outset for your welcome. Uh, Equally, I'm always thrilled to be here because I know you to be a people eager for God's Word. And so there we go. (laughs) To open God's Word with God's people is the joy of my life. Uh, And then thirdly, I'm thrilled to be here because I'm so grateful for your support of the seminary. Right from the beginning, uh, we've received board members from this church, uh, funding from this church, students from this church. uh, And so the work of Indianapolis Theological Seminary uh, really can't happen without, it cannot happen without uh, the support of healthy, gospel-preaching, Bible-believing local churches. And you're one of such, and we're deeply thankful for your fellowship and your partnership right from the beginning. Equally, I'm grateful for my friendship with your pastor, Drew. We are reading together right now a book called Remaking the World. And a passage of it struck me as deeply relevant for our times. The world has been remade, he says. And he concludes, he continues, uh, Justin Wilson is Andrew Wilson. I've been calling him Justin Wilson all this time. It's Andrew Wilson. Andrew Wilson, who's someone else, uh, (laughs) says, listen, he says, ours is a forgetful age. Lots of us do not remember the names of our great-grandparents. Perhaps it is unsurprising that we do not remember their world either. The rate of change in the last two centuries makes the past feel much further away than it actually is, which inclines us to fawn over the future and either patronize the past or ignore it altogether. And our technologies do not help us here. We spend much of our lives on devices that are designed to need replacing every three years, accessing social media platforms that amplify the sense of a continuous present and an absent past. The result, therefore, is confusion. The dizzying number of social changes in the Anglophone West from 2014 to today alone, gay marriage, Brexit, Trump, Black Lives Matter, transgender rights, Antifa, Me Too, and so forth, leave many people feeling reeling, punch drunk, even fearful of what will happen next. To put it another way, we live in an age when information is coming at us so fast with what seem to be world-altering headlines all the time that give us the impression that the world is coming apart at the seams. And that, in turn, makes us feel small and helpless. And I haven't even said anything about the current political season, major weather events, hurricanes, more than 35,000 wildfires this year alone, And a few years ago, you may remember, I was terrified when I learned about murder hornets. Do you remember them? Just the, you don't need to know about it. Their names are murder hornets, right? All these things grab the headlines and bewilder us, if not downright scare us. But are they really peculiar? Have we not faced illness, turmoil, and politics before? And will we not face them again? What, therefore, can anchor us in these kinds of times? Well, praise the Lord, the Scriptures indeed have a word for us in Psalm 146. So please turn in your Bibles to 146. Nearly everything I say will come from this passage. And so you will be helped if you have a copy of Psalm 146 in front of you. Let me read this for us. Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth, and on that day his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, 
who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Amen. In this psalm, this morning, we will see a vision for life, the universe, and everything that will give us interpretive glasses, as it were, to then see the world with its radical changes around us, nonetheless with hope and wisdom. Specifically, here's what we'll see. Number one, that the Lord is eternal. The Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, the Alpha and the Omega. He alone is God of heaven and earth, and he is eternal. Number two, the Lord gets things done. The Lord gets things done. And number three, to live a life that praises the Lord is to find the very meaning of life. The very meaning of life is to praise the Lord. The Lord is eternal. The Lord gets things done. And to praise the Lord is to find the very meaning of life. So to begin, the Lord is eternal. To demonstrate this, the psalm goes to the opposite. The psalm starts with the opposite of eternal. Look in verse 3 with me. Here is the opposite. The psalmist says in verse 3, we'll we'll come back to verses 1 and 2 later. In verse 3, put not your trust in princes, in the Son of Man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth, and on that day his plans perish. As I said, this is the negative. This is the wrong approach to life, to put your trust in princes. We are tempted. We are all perennial tempted. All people are tempted to see the the world's troubles and to instinctively look and to reach for the human leaders among us. Surely they are strong. Surely they have the resources. Surely they have the capacity to solve these problems and to help us at the same time. And so our hearts are drawn, in a lot of hopes, to such political heroes. And equally, to fear who we cast in our minds as political villains. But this psalm says, very clearly, put not your trust in princes. And then immediately gives us two reasons. Do you see those two reasons there? The first reason is in verse 3. In worldly leaders, there is no salvation. They are not as strong, they are not as able as they self-present. And it turns out they cannot save. And so history is filled with the evaporated promises of political dreams and illusions. I heard a report only two weeks ago from a a reputable source, uh, the World and Everything in It radio podcast, I couldn't believe when I heard this, that 97% of political campaign promises go unfulfilled. 97%. They're probably not lying. They probably intend to do these things, but then they're just not able when they come into office. In the Son of Man, there is no salvation. The second reason, then, is in verse 4. Whatever plans they do have are necessarily short-lived. When the princes die, and they will die, their great platforms go with them. And so when we put our hope in these worldly leaders, regardless of their charisma or how effective they may appear, we find ourselves longing for that which cannot satisfy and cannot last. Put not your trust in princes is the injunction of this psalm. And as I said, the converse is also true. It's clearly implied. Fear not the princes. Fear not the threats that they equally make, the political villains in our hearts. 20 years ago, I was a high school teacher in Maryland, 
just north of Washington, D.C. And I taught uh, 10th and 11th and 12th graders, 16, 17-year-olds. Some of them were 18, most of them 16, 17 years old. Uh, and they were very precocious in the arena of politics. They took class on politics. They took history courses. Uh, and even though they weren't of voting age yet, nonetheless, they were very interested in the, in the political arena. And I was a new teacher, and so they wanted to know in 2004 who the new theology teacher was voting for. This was the John Kerry, John, uh, sorry, John Kerry, yeah, John Kerry, George W. Bush uh, race of 2004. You may remember that. Uh, and they were just dying to know, Mr. P, Mr. P, who are you voting for? Who are you voting for? Every day, every week, they would hound me. Who are, they, who are you voting for? And I would say to them, donkeys live a long time. That was my answer. They come back the next day, who are you voting for, Mr. P? Donkeys live a long time. Next week, who are you voting for? Donkeys live a long time. Until one day, one of them smiled at me and nodded. He got it. He knew. He had read George Orwell's 1956 Animal Farm. Have you read Animal Farm? You should read Animal Farm. Good. Thank you for raising your hand. I am seminary. For, I appreciate that. Yes, Animal Farm. It's a short book. You will learn a lot about so, uh, society and government and politics and the human heart. Let me share with you a bit of what goes on in Animal Farm. At the beginning of the story, there's a farm called Manor Farm. And Manor Farm is run by Mr. Jones and all of his farm hands. And the animals on Manor Farm feel like the farm owner, Mr. Jones, is particularly oppressive, making them work long hours, extra hard, so on and so forth. I imagine Every animal on every farm feels that way. They're the ones out in the field doing all the labor, right? Until one night, one of the pigs gives a rousing speech. Old Major was his name. and says, if you can throw off the shackles of Mr. Jones, you can take over the farm, and you can turn it into a kind of utopia for animals. That night, Old Major died, but the next day, the animals took his words to heart, and ran off Mr. Jones and his farm hands and promptly renamed the Manor Farm into Animal Farm. And on Animal Farm, all animals are equal, though some animals are more equal than others. And the pigs found a way to sort of rise to the top and uh, claim that kind of political class for themselves. And as expected, there were two pigs vying with each other for ascendancy. One's named Napoleon, and the other name is Snowball. And they're trying to climb to the top of this political movement in order to uh, be preeminent among all the pigs and all the animals, and that's where we pick up. The whole farm was deeply divided on the subject of the windmill. Snowball did not deny that to build it would be a difficult business. Stone would have to be carried and built up into walls. Then the sails would have to be made, and after that, there would be need for dynamos and cables. How they were to be procured, Snowball didn't say. But he maintained that it could all be done in a year. And thereafter, he declared, so much labor would be saved that the animals would only need to work three days a week. Now, that's a winning platform. If you can promise the electorate, you'll only have to work three days a week. Woo! Napoleon, on the other hand, argued that the great need for the moment was to increase food production and that if they wasted time in the windmill, they would starve to death. Fear is another great motivator. The animals formed themselves into two factions under the slogan, vote for Snowball in the three-day week and vote for Napoleon in the full manger. Benjamin the donkey was the only animal who did not side with either faction. He refused to believe that food would be more plentiful or the windmill would save work. Windmill or no windmill, he said, life would go on as it always had gone on, that is, badly. As the story goes, Napoleon is able to run Snowball off the farm and claim that place of authority for himself. And so by the autumn, the animals were tired but happy. They had had a hard year. And after the sale of part of the hay and corn, no indication where the money went, the stores of food for the winter were none too plentiful, but the windmill compensated for everything. It was almost half built now. 
After the harvest, there was a stretch of clear, dry weather, and the animals toiled harder than ever, thinking it well worthwhile to plod to and fro all day with blocks of stone, if by doing so they could raise the walls another foot. Boxer, the horse, would even come out by night and work for an hour or two on his own by the light of the harvest moon. In their spare moments, the animals would walk around and round the half-finished windmill, admiring the strength and perpendicularity of the walls and marveling that they could have built anything so imposing, half a windmill. Only old Benjamin, the donkey, refused to grow enthusiastic about the windmill, though, as usual, he would utter nothing beyond the cryptic remark that donkeys live a long time. You see, donkey, uh, Benjamin, being a donkey as it is, having lived a long time, he had seen the political slogans come, the political slogans go. He had heard the promises, seen the results, and had a more stable and even-keeled attitude towards the new Snowball and Napoleon and all their promises. And you too, you live long enough. Not only do you empathize with Benjamin, but you just you see the truth of Psalm 146, don't you? The truth of Psalm 146 more and more. That the political power brokers rarely deliver on their grandiose vows, and they are soon enough supplanted by the next generation, and on and on we go. Now at the seminary, we have a board member who likes to say, don't hear what I'm not saying. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Hear what I am saying, and don't run off the conclusions of what I'm not saying. I'm not saying just government is not important. To the contrary, I believe that when justice and righteousness pervades the leadership class in their political structures, then flourishing is possible for the people underneath them, right? I'm not saying don't get involved in politics. I'm not saying don't vote. But I am saying what the psalmist is saying, put not your trust in princes. This is a matter of the heart. This is a matter of where your hope is. As we just sang, heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. It's about your heart, your hope, your trust. Put not your trust in princes. Look then at the very next verse, verse 5. The next verse, verse 5. The Lord will now be compared to all of that, proving himself to be the exact opposite, that he gets things done and he is eternal. If the princes of this world do not bring salvation and their plans go to the grave with them, the Lord is a Savior and his plans never die. Let's take a look. Verses 5 and 6. Blessed is he whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Think about that for a moment. It is the creator God who, by sheer verbal fiat, spoke the heavens and the earth into existence, filled them with living creatures, separated the waters from the land, brought forth vegetation, put the moon and the stars and the sun and the seasons all in their place. And to this day, the world is sustained by the word of the Lord's power. The sun comes up Because the Lord calls it up. The rains come down because the Lord sends the rain. And in turn, vegetation comes from the earth, and we gather food, and we enjoy the seasons, and we enjoy all the good things that the world produces for us who are made in God's image. All because the Lord is the maker of heaven and earth. But let's get down to the details. Let's get down to the details. What's on the Lord's agenda? What does he do in the created order? Start in verse 7. The Lord executes justice for the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. And the Lord watches over the sojourners. 
upholds the widow and the fatherless, and the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. Now that's a lot. That's a lot. But as we read that, did you notice those are the very things the world is crying out for right now? The things the the world is crying out for right now. Verse 7 says, he executes justice. Hear much about justice lately? He cares for the poor. Verse 8 says he has a program for health care, healing the eyes of the blind. Uh, Verse 7, back to verse 7, prison reform, compassion on the prisoners. Verse 9, issues of immigration, broken families. Again, justice, particularly judging the wicked. That's policing. I wonder how many people know that those are the things the Lord cares about. And he has been about them for thousands of years, long before they became talking points and flashpoints on the political stage. But I ask you, how? How does the Lord execute justice? How does he feed the hungry? How does he open blinds? How does he lift up the bow down? How does he watch over sojourners and widows and orphans, the fatherless? How does he do that? Just by magic? Just by, does he feed the hungry just by dropping food from heaven? Well, he did that once. Well, he did that multiple times. In Moses and twice in Jesus, right? But that's not his normal way. That's not his normal way. The Lord brings these realities to pass in history through his people, through the church, through the church. The Lord has billions of glad volunteers all over the world who throughout the ages of the church and Israel before that have brought these realities into the world. We actually just read it in in Deuteronomy 10. He says, you were sojourners and I loved you and cared for you as sojourners, So he turns and tells Israel, care for the sojourners. Do you see? Israel is called out, and equally the church is called out, to reflect these characteristics and concerns in the world amongst themselves to two ends. Number one, so that justice and caring for widows and orphans and the poor and sojourners happens in the world. Where does it happen? It happens amongst the community of the redeemed. Believers in Christ caring for one another. And then secondly, as a billboard to the world, a billboard to the world that says, if you care about the poor, if you care about illnesses being cured, if you care about widows and orphans and sojourners and justice and so on and so forth, this is the society, the church that lives under King Jesus, taught righteousness by him, but then lives it out into the world. I'm dying for someone on television or on my computer or on my cell phone Right To say, if you care about justice, if you care about social good in the world, join the church. Join the church. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, follow his teachings, and join the community where those things are happening. Wherever Christianity has been entrenched, it is left behind schools, universities, libraries, hospitals, hospitals for everyone, Orphanages, shelters, food pantries, soup kitchens, prison reform, democracy, and innovation. A fascinating third century document called the Didascalia describes the duty of bishops as educating orphans, aiding widows, and the purchase of firewood and food for the destitute, and to be on the lookout for injustice and the abuse of slaves. In 251 in Rome, 251, so that's If if you know church history, that's before Constantine comes to power. So it's a time of great persecution. In Rome, there were 1,500 dependents on the church's role of local churches. And so local churches kept storehouses of provisions of food, oil, wine, and clothing. In a season of persecution for 1,500 people in Rome. And these practices continue today. These practices continue today. Right? This very church was integral in starting Neighborhood Fellowship, a place that is reaching out to the world and bringing the love of Christ to that neighborhood. 
Uh, a story from my own life, uh, when I graduated from college, I moved to Denver, Colorado, and I was working with juvenile offenders, and my office was in a, was in a church called Church on the Outside. Church on the Outside. It was uh, an offshoot of Prison Fellowship. You've probably heard of Prison Fellowship. Because Prison Fellowship was running church on the inside. That's what the inmates called it. Church on the inside. Inside the walls of the prison. Well, those prisoners left behind in the world their wives and their children. And so church on the outside was a ministry to the functional widows and orphans in Denver and across Colorado, actually. Think of Servant's Heart, Wheeler Mission, right here in our own city. If the world is desiring these realities to come to pass in the world, they should join the church. You won't find these concerns in the unregenerate systems of the world. The church is the preserving force in the world. First, caring for its own as a polis unto itself with King Jesus over us, and then equally serving as an advertisement to the world that this is what a humanity looks like. This is what a new creation looks like where the attributes of God and his heart for the world can be experienced by all who come. That's what Israel is called to do. That's what the church is called to do. In short, evangelism is still the best program for curing the world. I'll repeat that because that's the thesis of this whole sermon. Evangelism is still the best program for curing the ills of this world. And then through evangelism, people hear the good news of Jesus Christ. They get born again by the Holy Spirit. They join then in a community that loves its own, that is taught meekness and mercy and compassion from Jesus for its own, then advertising to the world that this is what a new people can look like. So put not your trust in princes, but rather put your hope in the God of Jacob who brings all these good things to pass through his people. And did you notice in verse 5 that if you do that, you will be blessed. If you hope in the Lord like this, and you hope in God's people like this, you will be blessed. You will be blessed. In fact, more than blessed, you will find the very meaning of life. Here's what I mean. Here's what I mean by that. Psalm 146 is the beginning of what we call the hallelujah finale. The last five psalms in the book of Psalms, so the book of Psalms has 150 psalms. Altogether, we call that the Psalter. And the last five psalms of the Psalter, 146 and following, all begin with and end with praise the Lord. Begin and end with praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. So we already read that in Psalm 146. Look at Psalm 147. Just verse 1 will do for now. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. Uh, Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Psalm 149 in verse 1. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the godly. And then Psalm 150 is like the finale of finales. The crescendo of crescendos, where it just comes at you over and over again, praise the Lord. In fact, we sang that just a moment ago. I don't know if you noticed that. The prelude was Psalm 150. It says this, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipes. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, 
Why all this praise the Lord, praise the Lord right at the end of the Psalter? It's not simply because like a great musical set, you have to end on a high note, right? Or like, uh, like when you go to see the fireworks, you have to end with this finale right before the people leave. You have to really wazzle and dazzle them. Yes, I said wazzle. <laughs> it's a word. It's in Dr. Seuss, so it's a word. What's the point? What's the point? What's the point? Well, the point is the book of Psalms, the Psalter, is actually telling a story. It's telling a story. A story that is going to go somewhere. It's going to have a conclusion in the whole creation, everything that has breath, praising the Lord. Now, what is that story? Keep your finger right here in Psalm 146 and go back to Psalm 1. Go back to Psalm 1. And I will quickly tell you the story of the Psalms that ends with praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I like that sound. You all still have paper Bibles. That's good. Psalm 1 begins, blessed is the man. You see that? Blessed is the man. And then in verse 2, this man, why is he blessed? He's blessed because he delights in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. This man is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. All he does, he prospers. Now let's think for a minute. Let's think for a minute. Where else have you seen a man who is blessed in a garden setting with trees and rivers and fruit in the context of day and night and he's given a law? Who's that? It's Adam. Thank you. Raise your hand next time. It's Adam. Yes. And this is a picture, therefore, of the beauty of creation and life when humanity meditates on and lives out the law and the character of God. And what life was like and what life could have remained like if Adam had not transgressed the law of the Lord and plunged us all into sin and death. Sin and death. Those are the two great problems of our world. Right? And so Psalm 2, verse 1, begins, Why do the nations rage? You see, if Psalm 1 is the way the world should have been and could have been, and once was, Psalm 2 is what it is. The nations raging against God and amplifying lawlessness upon lawlessness creating situations where you have fatherless widows and sojourners who have to flee their country and, and uh, all the ills and problems of the world that Psalm 146 is redressing. And so then throughout the Psalms, there are two main characters. Two main characters. The first is David. It's David. And so the solution to the raging of the nations is King David. The Lord says, if I can simply take my king, my king who has a heart after my own heart, who loves righteousness and justice, and I can install that king as king of kings, the king over the other kings, he will bring righteousness and justice to the earth and lead humanity back into that relationship with God, law-abiding, peace-loving, flourishing Life of the Garden of Eden. That's the first character, David. But, as you likely know, David himself had his own issues, namely sin and death. He too transgressed the law of God, and he too died, like any other prince. And so if David can't do it, the second character in the Psalter is the son of David. The son of David. Maybe he can do it. Maybe a descendant from the house of David can bring righteousness and justice to the earth in the way he behaves, in the way he teaches his people, and thereby begin to spread the goodness and character of God amongst all the nations to the end that someday all of creation will be filled with God's glory as the waters cover the earth so that, Psalm 150, everything that has breath will praise the Lord. And that word for breath is the same word from Genesis 2, when the Lord filled all animate things with breath. Because that's the point 
of giving you breath so you can praise the Lord. And that will be all over the earth. Even the mountains and the trees will become alive and clap their hands and shout for joy in praising God. If the great son of David can do that. And in the New Testament, on every page, Jesus Christ is declared to be the son of David. The son of David. Who through his life, his death, and his resurrection will teach a people and then redeem a people. When Jesus died, he did not die for his own sins because he was perfectly righteous and perfectly just. He himself is the only man who could say he never sinned. He never sinned. So when he died, he did not die for his own sins. He died for the sins of his people. To forgive them of all their lawlessness. And then on the third day he was raised again. Ascended on high, from which he gives the Holy Spirit to his people. To then aid those same people in living more God-honoring lives than they did before they met Jesus. You understand? And that's the program of the church. To go from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Filling the world with the praise of God in communities called local churches. Where they're on the lookout for each other. Who needs help? Medical help, financial help, fatherless, widows, sojourners among us so that we can love them and care for them and lift up those who are bowed down as a community that's bringing the Garden of Eden, as it were, to life even already and serving as a billboard to the rest of the world that if you like that, put your trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, the reception of eternal life, and join our local church with us. In other words, history has a meaning. History has a goal. From the Garden of Eden to a new creation where righteousness pervades and lawlessness and sinfulness is no more. In an eternal heaven, we call it, right? In an eternal new creation. But that new creation is already dripping back into history in the church. To put it another way, if you are a Christian, you are the vanguard of a new humanity. You are emissaries from the future, commissioned by King Jesus himself to live out his righteousness, his understanding of the Sermon on the Mount, law, the Psalms, all of Jesus' teachings, so that we can flourish and thrive together, and then also hold out open hands to the world to come and experience the same in the community of the redeemed. Forgiven by Jesus through his cross and filled with his Holy Spirit because of his resurrection. And our king is still alive and still governing and leading his people, as we heard even at the beginning of this service. He is with us and his goodness and mercy follow us. And I would simply say that the Republican and Democratic platforms are too small to contain that kind of vision. Jesus has a world-altering agenda through his people. So whatever the latest Napoleon and Snowball might be promising or threatening, trust them not, fear them not, but don't hear what I'm not saying. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Next week, Snowball or Napoleon will be elected. <laughs> I'm not saying don't vote, vote, vote. You're passionate enough about it, you got some skill, run for office yourself. We live in an amazing time in history when you're all invited into the political process. That's just unprecedented and unheard of. Uh, but it's happening here. And so get involved. But don't let your heart create heroes to worship and to trust or villains to hate. We're all made in the image of God. We're all frail. And we're all perishing. We need a Savior who can forgive our sins, give us his Holy Spirit, and promise us eternal resurrection life. Think, therefore, on the calling of God upon the people of God to be the salt and light in the world, the ministry of the church, to be the ultimate cure for the ills of the world. 
So let your heart be lifted up this morning to the crucified and raised King Jesus. Do not fear if next week your candidate doesn't win. Do not fear. And do not be over elated if your candidate does win because you never trusted or hoped in them anyway. Their visions and platforms are too small. You hope for, you trust in, the forgiveness of sins, resurrection from the dead, and the life everlasting. So be it politics or COVID or protests or riots, I agree. The world has changed, as Andrew Wilson says. The world has changed. But not because of those things. The world has changed because the Son of David has been crucified for your sins and raised on the third day and has given the Holy Spirit to the world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do give you thanks. We give you praise for you are worthy of such praise. You are the creator. You are the sustainer. You are the one who gives every good and perfect gift comes from you. And you are with us in our trials when we find ourselves as sojourners or hungry or bowed down in need of being lifted up. It is you who does that through your word, through your spirit, through your people. And for that, we give you praise. Steady our hearts, we ask that we may love you more and speak more clearly about you to this world, to the end that you would be praised in more people's hearts. The lost will be win, the lost will be won, and that your people will be built up and edified, and your name will be made great among the nations. Amen and amen.